Let's talk about the new rules of uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility. Um, and in particular, I think uh, a great way to start is we're going to talk about kind of the old way and the new way we've really looked at CSR as a discipline. By way of background, um, I'll tell you a little bit in maybe 30 seconds about how we look at CSR. And at Top Global, we're um, a network of 12 different agencies that span all sorts of different disciplines. And many uh, of our agencies do really deep CSR work. That that comes you know, that includes you know PR Hacker. That includes Top Data, which is looking at data and metrics involved in CSR. That includes Top Community, which is looking at all kinds of whether that's environmental or social or, or, or sort of governance impact. Um, and we just love doing good, but also we believe that doing good is doing good business. And so um, all of that relates to one another in, inside the top universe. And then just in some of, you know, quickly our capabilities, we actually bring to CSR uh, many different perspectives, uh, whether that's core communications or how do we activate digitally or how do we incorporate this into a, a marketing or advertising campaign or um, how do we um, engage and really uh, inspire uh, our, you know, our employees, our team, our workers, our C-suite, our board, um, all of those are things that we do. And so we'll come at this from a multidisciplinary perspective. Um, and finally, we've done work for small scrappy startups that are forward looking and, and, and want to bring, you know, CSR doing good into their, their direction from the beginning. And it's much easier to start with something while you're still small to really big companies and big, whether it's corporate foundations or it's um, corporate communications groups. We do all kinds of, you know, CSR, ESG work with all of those groups as well. So that brings us to kind of a, a funny slide, which is how I got started in this to begin with. Um, I actually, in a prior career, before, before running a global agency, uh, was an author, um, and I was an author of this book. It was called How to Go to College Almost for Free, and was all about winning uh, college scholarships. And what actually happened by writing that book was I started getting all of these phone calls and emails from big financial services companies. And it, it tended to be their, either their CSR manager or their foundation director, executive director, or uh, sometimes, you know, it was actually even a, you know, the special assistant to the CEO who would call me up. And these were all companies that had an interest in making an impact or doing good or were doing business in the vertical of education. And they saw my book. It was all about paying for college and, and, and winning college scholarships and getting more financial aid. And they wanted to, um, you know, uh, they, they wanted to, to, to partner in some ways in many cases and do some kind of good together. So that was actually my first introduction way before I knew what an agency was. Um, you know, I was 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. Um, was, you know, this kid who had written this self-published book. And suddenly I was talking with a lot of companies about how they could do more uh, corporate goods. So that was actually my first introduction. And then years later, after having rolled out a lot of these programs, um, it really shifted. But that's kind of just the, the final piece of, of my sort of unique perspective on this, which was really as a spokesperson, as a partner for many of these programs. Um, and that's how I got my start. So with that being said, let's ask this first central question, which is, what corporate social responsibility questions are we asking now that we didn't ask before? In fact, what are the new questions that sort of direct us to the new rules of CSR that are different from the old way we used to do things? And so let's start with one. First question, the old way used to be, how do we create a special track for CSR initiatives? We were like, how do we carve out something separate, something special, something unique? Let's make sure we don't forget about CSR and let's sort of carve out its own, its own you know, path, its own share of voice, its own bandwidth. Now, the new way is actually much more of how do we make CSR part of our integrated strategy? And we'll talk about three different types of CSR activities and, and why I think they, all three types should be part of your, 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 your core activities. But it's much more an integrated process now uh, than it was before. And I, I would actually argue that the businesses who integrate it more um, actually, you know, one, do a better job at CSR and actually is more sustainable. So it's not so much this separate laying out over here that like, you know, 90% of our time, we focus on growing the business. 10% of the time, we focus on doing some good, but how do we integrate it all together? And in, in fact, 
um, you know, if the good that we do supports the business, and if the business that we do supports the good, that's actually the best situation. So we, we were looking at, in general, much more integrated programs. And that is a challenge, actually, for a lot of businesses just because of organizational structure, right? We'll talk about sort of the different types of CSR activities, but many of those types of activities actually don't reside in the same person or even the same team. We'll talk about how that improved communication really becomes important. So that's the first old way, new way. Here's another one, old way. We would ask ourselves, how do we develop CSR pillars? Or, and pillar just means sort of a track or a theater, an area that we're gonna focus on. And how does that help us address potential criticisms? Um, a lot of you know, CSR type work maybe in the past was sort of like, how can we inoculate our business over things that maybe are not ideal about our business that we want to a little bit compensate for, or try to try to try to tell a different story. The the new way is that how do we align our CS CSR activities with our core business purpose? It's not so much that we're we're sort of making up for something or compensating for something, but actually they should all be moving in the same direction. And one of the biggest challenges uh, when you look at corporate um, kind of CSR programs is that not only is the sort of CSR message, purpose, and direction unclear, but actually even the business purpose or business values or business mission is also often unclear too. So what actually happens as a result of this is that we actually need to take, you know, what is our sort of branding or brand strategy activity on the one hand for the business and our CSR activity, we actually need to figure out a way to bring them together and make them align um, moving forward. So um, that alignment is key. Um, and that's often why uh, sets up into the next one, why we have to deal with C CSR at the top levels of the company. Brings us to the old way. The old way would be, how do we develop a CSR team? If we're a bigger company, if we're a smaller company, some folks who are going to, you know, you know, take on some of the CSR functions that can report on our progress. So most people, you know, want to feel like they're making progress. Certainly that's great for um, employees, customers, partners, uh, board members to understand our progress. So we would typically spend a lot of time figuring out like, how are we going to report this? The new way is we say, we ask this question, how can the CSR team coordinate seamlessly with the CEO and the board? So it's actually not just reporting to this in progress, but actually working with collaborating. And really, if we look at the academic literature, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, kind of business school professors have, have looked closely at this too. All of the CSR programs that are most effective usually have very high uh, uh, involvement, engagement, participation from the highest levels of the company. And that's usually the easiest way, although it's not that easy to get that to get to that level, but it's the easiest way to actually integrate the whole thing. Um, if it's managers that are really just reporting um, on, on what they're doing, and if it is you know twenty minutes of a you know day long board meeting, it really doesn't have enough um, sort of uh, weight integration planning behind it to make a huge impact. So really. The new way is let's get the CEO, for instance, much more involved in the process earlier on. And maybe we can create a process where it's not all about every, having everything by the time you know it reaches the CEO that everything's buttoned up and perfect, but we're actually getting input along the way. We're actually turning the CEO or the C-suite or the board into key, key stakeholders, not just in the finished product, but in the process of creating the program and the product, and that becomes really important. Brings us to old way. We used to ask this question, how can we expand our CSR program into new areas of impact? That sounds good, right? And in general, we'd love to impact more things, new areas, new ways. How do we brainstorm creatively? That's in general a positive thing. The issue becomes in actual implementation it's really easy to, uh, to lose your focus. So the new way is how can we focus our CSR program by sharpening our evaluation criteria? I think it's far more common that companies are doing 
probably too many activities and losing their focus, then they're doing way too few and really need to expand it. Uh, companies, I mean, who are already engaging in CSR. And what typically happens is there's just creep over time. And why is that? Well, there's lots of ways to impact the world. There's lots of good to, that you can do. But from the point of view of having a CSR program that probably has limited resources and we want to make the biggest impact we can, two, we want to be able to align all the stakeholders, employees, customers, partners, leadership. Um, if we have more focus, it's easier to get alignment. Um, and, uh, and three, how do we even actually um, go beyond, uh, you know, uh, the uh, kind of the short-term impact to medium and long-term gains? What can we do? So all of those things, actually, uh, all of those reasons put value on focusing our CSR program and sharpening our evaluation criteria over time. So that means we've got to be more disciplined. That means we've got to be more diligent. We've got to understand what falls within um, the CSR tracks or pillars that we want to pursue and what falls outside of those. And we need criteria to really do it. So um, if, if, you know, criteria is not really codified and is not really clear and is not really aligned by all, all, fac all factions, then it gets difficult um, to make some of those hard decisions. And again, there's lots of worthy programs. There's lots of good that can, can be done. But how do we kind of focus our, ourselves in a way that we can make the most impact, that we can do the best work for our, 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 our business, we can do the best work for society, all that requires focus. Brings us to the old way. The old way would be, how can we gather stories and anecdotes to illustrate our work? And stories are powerful. Stories are important. So I'm not, I'm not um, suggesting we don't need great stories, great examples, great anecdotes, great impact. But usually, if we wanted to show impact, the old ways, we'd, we'd kind of look for those kind of stories that we could put on a website or a microsite or let's film a quick video or, um, you know, let's uh, do a PR campaign around it. And, and, and the stories and the anecdotes are, part, are important, but it actually flows from a different part of the process, which is the new way is we ask ourselves, how can we develop quantitative metrics to gauge past performance? And then we often will do that first and then look at stories and examples and anecdotes that help you know, bring color and bring life um, to those metrics. But the biggest change has really been a move to how do we measure? How do we measure in a way that lets us know that we're doing good? And how do we then do that, uh, take those measurements and then communicate it to a broader audience, and that becomes really important. The old way. The old way, we would ask ourselves, how do we launch our new CSR program and make a big splash, right? It's a big deal. If it's a new program, we, we typically spend a lot of time working on it. We want to make a big splash. We want employees to get excited about it. We want the board to get excited about it. We want journalists to cover it. Um, those are all good outcomes, but in our experience, that creates such a big project, such a quest for perfection, that it often just really slows down actual impact. And so the new way is how do we phase in our new CSR program to reach both short-term and long-term goals? So we might need a version of this program uh, that, um, you know, maybe it's not the full-fledged content hub for, you know, our social good that would be on our website to start with. Maybe it's a quick microsite or a couple landing pages that move us in that direction. And then phase two, we look at doing more. Maybe instead of having, um, we'll talk about how you develop pillars in a second, but if you have a seven, instead of having these five pillars that we must launch on day one, maybe we're going to phase in one or two of those first, focus there and roll out new things and tell more of a narrative or a story about how our program is gathering steam. So we, we like big launches, we like big things. Um, you know, we're, we're also you know, a, a, a PR agency, so we tend to do these kind of big PR activations too. Um, however, I actually think for, for long-term sustained growth, it's better to make impact sooner in more bite-sized chunks and then phase them in um, as you grow. And I think that's one of the, the, the biggest, uh, changes is not necessarily 
having to do this all at once, but kind of incrementally improving and then having key milestones and getting better at advancing it um, um, with every quarter or every year. So Jackson, before I go on to the next part here, are there questions? Are there comments um, about kind of the old way and the new way? Um, what I like to say is that CSR is less about, you know, having easy answers than about asking the right questions. And I think if you sort of take the sum total of everything I've just described, what, what, what is the kind of the bottom line? You're sort of seeing more integration rather than silos, more leadership from the top of the company rather than just reporting to the top of the company, um, more alignment with business uh, goals with your CSR goals, um, more smaller chunks rather than bigger chunks, more phase in, more continual progress, more measurement. That's where that's the direction you know, really the whole field has gone. And in Jackson, I, I love any, any questions or comments. Sure, I will, I, I'd asked before you joined Ben um, for our attendees to share the biggest challenges that they face in implementing CSR within their own organizations um, as, as kind of a program. And Bernadette pointed out that one of the biggest challenges that she faces is identifying what to report and understanding what topics most resonate with with customers, regulators, and investors, right? Um, and I think this really comes down to asking the right questions, right? That comes down to this slide. What are, what are the kinds of questions we need to be asking in order to understand, you know, what we should be reporting? Okay, great, great question. I, th I think a, a few ways to, to kind of answer that. Um, and, and then I think we'll see some, some of that reflected in the new rules. Uh, number one is that I actually think it's, it's part of the premise of your question, which is, which is a good premise, which is that there are different stakeholders in this process. And often what we will do is look at those stakeholders and look at the different personas and the different uh, persona groups that span those kind of stakeholders. So can we define our audience, number one, and can we understand their needs better? And so, you know, what we'll look at for kind of reporting and overall metrics was, you know, what we often will have like, you know, a report, or, or something we're producing. But aspects of that report will be actually highlighted in different ways for different persona groups. So I think number one is you actually have to have not only your audiences, but the personas within those audiences, right? For instance, like investors, there'll be different you know, types of individuals that will care about different things, right? So one type will care about really like, you know, one persona might be like really like responsible investing. They want to know that the company is aligned with things that they want to be aligned with. But a totally, you know, different type of investor audience actually uh, may be looking at like the operational effectiveness of the company. And in some of their, you know, in your CSR programs and messages, they just want to know that you're not going to be disrupted by um, other, you know, socioeconomic, political events on the world stage or in the national stage or locally that could impact the business. So, two very different audiences within just like that investor segment. And by starting to like break out the personas and doing it formally so you can kind of write these down, defining what those audiences care about, what are the pain points they experience, driving towards what are the defining moments that would help address those pain points, and then saying, what are the metrics that follow through on those defining moments, it can become much, much clearer. So that's like, you know, kind of a kind of one one quick example. Um, what I would also say, though, the, the 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 slightly longer example is that some of those metrics and some of those that reporting can evolve, and so you don't have to get it right the first time. But what really is helpful is a feedback loop to get feedback and understand. So oftentimes that feedback loop exists because you know if you're presenting to like let's say the program to the board, they're going to come back and they're going to ask questions, and if you get a question that's a little bit harder to answer you know, next board meeting, you're gonna be able to answer it better. That's kind of automatic. But how is their feedback loop and how do we put more in play from investors or customers or, you know, suppliers or partners? That becomes really important. So that's why typically early on in the process, if we're working on something, we might do interviews with those stakeholders, um, whether that's a combination of focus groups or surveys or in-depth interviews or whatever it might be, it's great to do that research ahead of time. But so short answer, kind of understand your, your groups, your personas better to evolve the dialogue. Um, because if you have that feedback loop, you can usually get better over time and you don't have to be perfect right out of the bat. 
So um, let's move on to kind of the new rules and uh, talk about um, some, some new uh, ways to kind of think about this moving forward. So central question here is what new rules govern CSR programs as we know it? And how can those new rules um, influence the action we take today, tomorrow, uh, next week, and next month? So new rule number one, think about CSR in multiple dimensions. I think previously, and, and, and with a lot of companies, it's kind of like this, you know, it's either the CSR bucket or the ESG bucket or the, you know, doing good bucket. And many of those activities are sort of like all combined together and thought of in the same way. Um, but what I would suggest is actually there's three main types of CSR activities. And if you start looking at them um, distinctly, you can have a better understanding of, of, of how to move your program forward. So these are the three types of CSR activities. Um, on the one hand, there's philanthropy. Philanthropy is like is is efforts that are not designed, you know, to produce profits. It's not designed to improve the core business. It's something that you might choose to um, to to support, right? So very common for a company is a company has a, a headquarters or an office in a certain community, and they're gonna, you know, sponsor uh, different local activities for that community that do, do, that do good. So. First kind of bucket is that sort of philanthropy, probably the easiest to understand. Second bucket is operational effectiveness. So this is all about improving existing business functions to improve operations across the value chain. This is all about actually improving within your business model. So maybe you're a company that you need, you know, raw components and you source them from certain suppliers. And maybe you might change those suppliers that you source from uh, because of concerns <clears throat> about are their values aligned with yours, but also it impacts your core business. So it impacts maybe you could actually save money in, um, in, in sourcing those components. Uh, maybe you could become more efficient in how you source them. So what category two really talks about is how do we improve our efficiency, effectiveness, and alignment on values? And how do we um, do that to move forward our CS, our program, but also our business goals. So that's kind of bucket number two from within the business model. Now, the third bucket is business model transformation. Um, this is probably the most rare of the three. And this is looking at how do we change up our business model entirely uh, because we want to deliver more societal goods. So for instance, um, Unilever, a you know, big global uh, CPG company, um, they, uh, in years past, have provided micro loans to, you know, to small businesses in, um, you know, really a kind of rural or developing parts of the world that would allow them to have business, that allow them to have, you know, kind of uh, sell different products and goods that aren't in traditional stores, for instance, that might get needed items that Unilever makes to audiences they don't normally reach. So that's a business model transformation because a company like Unilever or a big CPG company is really good at working through distributors and wholesalers and distribution and transportation to get products where they need to go. But this is a different way. This says, you know, maybe by, you know, to get places where there aren't a lot of physical stores, let's empower individual local entrepreneurs in a different sort of way. So that's a business model transformation. So where does this leave us when we kind of look at these three types of CSR activities? Well, one, I would argue that within your um, uh, kind of uh, uh, tracks or theaters or sort of pillars of your CSR program, there's room for all three types. And if you've typically been a business or a company that's relied on one, like, yeah, you do a lot of philanthropy or, oh, you're uh, you know, just doing operational effectiveness or, oh, you're trying to think of things outside of the box for business model transformation. Um, usually uh, this framework can help you brainstorm other dimensions. And I love to see companies that have all three dimensions, right? There's a part that's above and beyond just business goals, that's philanthropy. There's a part that's really firmly in the business. How do you drive your business forward, but in a way that's consistent with the values you believe in? And then third, how do you upend the whole system and think about something entirely out of the box? When you do business model transformation, you get a company like Panera, 
Um, if, if you ever, you know, eaten at a Panera, uh, Panera uh, kind of a kind of fast casual restaurant where um, they had for many years um, stores that didn't charge money. It was actually just meant to help, you know, those uh, who were homeless and others. And they had stores where like, you actually, you know, went in and actually figured out if, if, if you got a sandwich, how much you could afford and you donated it and you got your sandwich instead. So all of those things come from different ways of thinking about this. And one of the key points of why this is important is when you realize that CSR is impacted by all three uh, dimensions, then you realize that there actually has to be better communication among your, um, your company, your team. So phil phil philanthropy, that might reside in you know, the foundation, let's say, if you're a big company. But operational effectiveness might reside in certain managers who are making decisions on the supply chain, where things are coming from, right? Business model transformation might be the pet project of a certain you know, C-suite leader that just has a vision for something. So the issue becomes all these parts that impact CSR are all in different parts of the company. And if we recognize they're there, we can facilitate communication and better integration. So that's kind of point number one. And, and, and Jackson, before I continue, um, you know, any um, questions, comments, and I know Jackson, you work on some, some CSR programs with our clients as well, um, on like kind of that distinction between sort of philanthropy and operational effectiveness and how, you know, really, you can work within the business or you can work outside the business. Um, and both of those uh, elements can impact, you know, the corporate social responsibility that you demonstrate and the good that you ultimately do. Definitely. As much as I think that that sort of any of these approaches are valid, one thing that I'd underscore, because I, 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 I think the Panera Bread model sort of speaks to this, right? They're... Um, their free restaurant model was a, a super interesting and bold experiment, um, but it wasn't sustainable in in doing what they were trying to do. They found that, you know, it, it attracted people who had a lot of needs beyond just lunch, and it posed problems to actually making money at the same locations that they were doing these this this kind of CSR activity from. Um, and and so I think the the consideration I, I would sort of urge all of us to, to, to have is how can, how can we build programs in that kind of work with the bigger picture and that are sustainable? And I think there are some companies like Panera that can afford to make like really, really bold, you know, really bold experiments. Yeah. Um, but, but for many of us, we don't have the, the luxury of having, you know, the, the opportunity to do that, which, which I think sometimes requires even more creative thinking to figure out how can we pursue programs that are sustainable and impactful um, and, and that speak to the, the, the core values of our business um, and, and they can be carried on for more than just a short period? Sure. Well, and, and that's why that sort of like alignment between CSR purpose and business purpose becomes really important, right? Because I think when you have that in the case of Panera, um, there's, you know, it, it sort of on the surface seems like it'd be aligned, right? Like, like we, we make food and we ought to give out more food. I mean, that, that's certainly true, that that part's aligned. But when you look deeper, some of the problems with like these locations was that it actually, the objective of the CSR conflict with the objective of the business, right? It was difficult, so you didn't have the alignment and hence that type of conflict, um, particularly when the business has to exist and be a ongoing entity that, that grows and, and, has, and, and has key business goals as well, that creates a lot of conflict that, that makes it that, that usually the CSR program is going to lose out if it actually conflicts with the business goal. And that's why getting that alignment early on in kind of a deeper way becomes really important. Absolutely. And I'd also remind uh, all of our attendees that we, we would love to field your questions um, kind of as you have them, your comments. If there's any unique challenges you're facing, uh, please bring them up. We'd love to talk about them. Right. And then, you know, and, and, and one one, I think, note, Jackson, that I mean, I, I'd even just add on this because we're, we're starting to talk about alignment with like sort of business purpose and, and, and broader purpose. But I actually think, you know, another trend that is important is that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. It, in my mind, it's good if there's a marketing benefit from the work you do. If there's a benefit that, that does draw, you know, kind of positive sentiments or why, because I think that actually helps with sustainability a lot. So even if you're a cynical person, you say like, hey, we ought to be doing this out of our desire to do good, 
not our, out of our desire to sell more widgets. I actually like seeing programs align with selling more widgets because I think it's more sustainable. I think there's more investment from, uh, from top levels of the company. I think um, you know, doing good is not in conflict with doing good business. Um, and, and a great example of that is, is we did work for Milkbone, um, CSR work from you know, Milkbone, the brand, and they had given a ton of money to um, uh, you know, different, basically those organizations that, that train dogs to help people with special needs. And one of the things that I think that, that we did when we looked at that was like, hey, you, know, you guys have given away tens of millions of, of dollars over a period of years and, and no one knows you've done this. So let's figure out a way to do that. So actually what we ended up doing for them was we packaged this program that we called Dogs Who Changed the World. It was an awards program. We recognized dogs and gave awards to dogs in local communities. And these were all dogs that had been funded by Milkbone's investments of tens of millions of dollars in these kinds of sort of like CSR initiatives to train, train these dogs. And so by doing that, we kind of put this PR lens of this awards program, all the local media, you know, we're covering, you know, lots, lots of B-roll of cute, cute dogs doing amazing things. But it actually brought a lot of attention to Milkbone and was great from a marketing perspective, but it also rejuvenated the brand. Like, look at all the work we're doing. Like, like employees were excited. They were excited to see it on TV. And others were then saying like, yeah, we got to do more like this. What else can we do? So I don't think that, I mean, there, there's something to say for, for, for not doing something just because it's, it's, a, it's a PR photo op. But there's also something to be said, but like if we're doing great work, how do we amplify and magnify it? Because I think it leads to a lot more good things. And I think that's maybe a little bit different than the way we thought about this before. Definitely. Well, and I think it adds a lot of value to the customer. I think if you look at a brand like Tom's Shoes or Patagonia, for example, those are two incredibly successful, valuable companies who have inherent in their product, right, certain certain ethical considerations and certain goals uh, that, that kind of go beyond the core business model. Um, but they, they really drive a lot of value for the consumer. You know, someone who's wearing a Patagonia jacket or a pair of Tom's Shoes um, are frequently proud to do so, at least in part, because of the social mission that they drive. So I, I, I think that, yeah, there's something to be said about, you know, the marketing we do around these CSR activities um, provide value that, that goes far beyond uh, something that could be, be summed up as, as like cynical self-interest, but actually, you know, make it sustainable, as you said, but also drive value and, and, and joy for the end consumer. Well, and end consumer, and actually, by the way, big trend, um, not just B2C, but B2B. A lot more companies, a lot more B2B companies kind of embracing um, sort of strategies that would be more associated with like consumer focused B2C companies that, that are trying to get a real kind of positive, broad PR benefit. Um, I think B2B companies are doing more, not for the broad benefit, but for like really um, uh, kind of, you know, having a cohesive message for, for suppliers, um, partners, investors, and more. Let's go to new rule number two, which is recruit allies to accelerate your impact. Um, I think one of the new rules, and, and particularly if, if, if it's a program that's not mature yet, that's just starting out, is that, you know, like anything, like any solving any big problem, it's a lot harder to do it on your own. I think one of the things that we really look at is, can we think strategic about the allies we can have to accelerate our impact. And that has really, um, I think, changed in how we evaluate that. So I think what's very traditional for CSR is like, let's, you know, evaluate, um, you know, okay, who are we going to donate money to, right? And let's make sure they're kind of supportive of, uh, of our values and let's make sure they're going to use it in the right way. Um, and we might evaluate people or, or kind of partners on that basis. But I think where a lot of the field in the industry is going is, how do we do more because we're just one company? Um, maybe we're a pretty big company, but there's, 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 there, there's a limit to what we can do. And how do we amplify this by a lot of different allies that can accelerate our impact? So, you know, typically we think of allies and there's partners whose organization can impact, their impact can elevate our own. And we're measuring less just based on, you know, are they you know, align. So we want to be, you know, we want their logo next to ours. And actually, how do we, you know, provide something that they can't achieve on their own? And how do uh, they provide something that we couldn't do on our own? And how are we 
sort of like better off. Now, there's also sort of, you know, the kind of the individual story, the testimonial, the example. So now what we're looking for is actually impact that we've actually made. So how can we cultivate allies that increase that dimension of us understanding real stories, real impact? This isn't just like a line on them in our budget. How does this actually like make a difference on the front line? So we look for allies that can, can, can help with that. And the third, we look for allies that can spread the word, called the buzz builder, but that's like, how do we have strategic, strategically positioned groups or companies who can get everyone talking, who can get, who can rally the troops, who can spread the word about this? So as we look at building a CSR program, we look at building it within our company, but we're much more outwardly looking now to say, who are the strategic partners that can help us really speed this up, accelerate, and amplify everything that we're doing, and, and none of us do this alone. Uh, brings us to uh, uh, new rule number three, which is align CSR metrics with business metrics. I think one of the biggest things, and I think if you want to enact very fast organizational change to do good and organizational alignment, one of the fastest things you can do is simply change the metrics by which you evaluate people. So in terms of sort of bringing about organizational change, we're often one of the biggest advocates for metrics. So if we want to change how the board thinks about something, change the metrics by which the board evaluates. If we want to, you know, influence how the CEO might think about embracing a certain initiative, look at how we're measuring the metrics of that to better align that with business purpose. If we want to change uh, behavior of our uh, employees, um, a great way to do that is an example like Ben and Jerry's. And the reason I like this example is it kind of shows you how CSR doesn't have to stay in its own lane. And so one thing that's notable about Ben and Jerry's is that um, obviously a very socially driven company in, in kind of all of their marketing. Uh, but in particular, what they did was in the annual review for every employee, in the annual kind of KPIs that we would measure to measure your performance, doing good is one of the metrics that's evaluated along with all the other metrics that you would, you would get for your job. So if you evaluate by like, you know, how, how much are you accomplishing? How much are you contributing to the business's bottom line? And how much good are you doing? And it's right there, part and parcel to the same. And so if you're going into your annual review and you're uh, a Ben and Jerry's employee, you know, you're going to be asked about this. You know, that actually like this might, you know, you know, impact whether you're promoted to the next role or the next job, it's part and parcel the same. So as other business goals. So what I kind of love to, to see is that how can we take our CSR reporting that might be in a report to the, to the point or question of, of Bernadette earlier, and then how do we integrate it in all the other types of reporting that we do? So not just a section of the annual report, but how do we integrate it with um, other metrics we're reporting to, to at a board meeting? How do we integrate it with um, other things we're talking about from a corporate communications perspective? How is it not in its own silo, but how do we bring it as a part of everything? And if you wanna change behavior, one of the fastest ways to change behavior or get alignment is to change the metrics by which, which you evaluate people. So that's new rule number three. New rule number four, change your access to distinguish your program. And so I get a lot of questions too um, about you know, when you're creating a CSR program, how do you make it ownable for uh, your company or brand? And, and ownable, not, not meaning like, just like how do you find kind of rich territory that is unique to you, that can distinguish you from your competitors, certainly, that can distinguish you and, and have you making impact in ways that's not just duplicating the efforts of others. And to think about that, we often think about um, how to think about uh, the access by which you evaluate your program. So an example of this, and, and we really pulled this from our kind of branding we work we do for branding strategy is that how can we evaluate those, you know, working in, 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 in our kind of track or, or uh, area of, um, of, of CSR work that we're doing? And how do we start changing the axes to find white space for us? So what we might do is, is start looking at, okay, our 
certain, are these type of companies really like hands-on, the grassroots, very local? Are these, uh, that's one axis. And then on the other side of the axis is like, what about global impact, right? So it might be local and global might be one of our axes. Now, if we look at a different axis, maybe we would say, you know, okay, um, this, you know, these companies or these organizations, these brands are forward looking. They're looking to the future versus the other dimension is what's happening right now. So you start looking at these axes, you evaluate other programs that are in the mix, and then you can start to find white space for yourself. So you start to see that within this track that you're doing, wow, okay, so everyone is, you know, globally focused and forward looking. Might there be an opportunity for local focus in the here and now or vice versa? So really important for sort of finding your ownable territory. This is like sort of a, a, a technique we, we brought over from our brand strategy practice into CSR. But how can we look at the other players in our space? How can we look at their activities? How can we mix and match these axes by, by having these kind of binary decisions by how you orient the program? And if you put the right combination together, how can we essentially open up a quadrant where no one else exists and we can make one, greater impact because no one's no one's operating there. Two, much more clear messaging. It's very clear how we can message to that quadrant. Uh, and, and three, um, it's an ownable area. And to the question I, I get, and maybe many of you have, which is how do we do something that's impactful, but like ownable, that's associated with us. When you find that white space, it becomes ownable. So that's a powerful way and a powerful strategy for thinking about how you position um, your CSR program. Um, and finally, new rule number five, document your program's defining moments. So defining moments, um, I will give you a definition of it, but defining moments is that moment where, and actually, let me, let me just, I think I have a slide here. The moment in which our program has the highest perceived value in the minds of our target audience. So how do we create something where, you know, at our best day, at our best moment, um, that this is what our program accomplishes. And how do we connect that to pain points that we can help solve? So we'll ask a question like, what stakeholder frustrations is our company uniquely positioned to solve? And what is the exact moment where our stakeholders realize that our product or really I should say company has solved, has helped solve this core problem? So really, it's a process of looking at how do we sort of gather and from, the, you know, from like, can everyone in our organization, in our company, align on, oh yeah, we are doing great as a company when this moment happens, this singular thing. And all that we do when we kind of ladder to stories or anecdotes or emotions or videos starts, um, uh, starts, highlighting those defining moments. So, so let me give you an example from kind of our work for sort, sort of, you know, Milkbone again, where for Milkbone, we created this program called Dogs Who Change the World that highlighted all of their philanthropic contributions to these, to these um, organizations that, that help dogs who help people. And we had these amazing defining moments where, you know, this dog, you know, detected a seizure before another person realized it and, 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 and literally saved their life. Or this other occasion where this dog, you know, did this other amazing, you know, noteworthy thing. And, and we thought, you know, wow, these dogs are like, you know, Olympic athletes of dogs, right? These are like so high performing and so amazing and so having such an impact. And as we started looking at how do we capture those moments, one of the things we actually created, the first ever time we did this was we created these almost like doggy baseball cards that highlighted the dog and highlighted that moment and that, you know, moment of, of sort of excellent or amazement or contribution that that dog did. And when we kind of rolled that out, those moments became a rallying cry for people within the organization, outside the organization. Like they knew these dogs by name. It had a deeper resonance. So defining moments is like a really powerful, especially when combined with the white space we just talked about, about changing the axes, is an incredible opportunity to kind of add the emotion and the qualitative to all of the qual quantitative in the data that we do. And so that's new rule number number five. And it's about defining those, tracking those, understanding 
um, uh, how to message those, and that can make a huge difference in your ability to kind of communicate what your uh, CSR program um, is all about. So, Jackson, I know we're about out of time. Um, are there any final comments or questions? And I, I know we had a lot of names. But like, I, I, for some reason, Bernadette is in my mind. Bernadette, I don't know if you have any other questions. Are there others who have questions as well? Um, as we do that, I just want to kind of go over. So, you know, new rules, and just to kind of talk about it here, sort of had five for you, which are uh, number one. Uh, think about CSR in multiple, multiple dimensions, and specifically, are you making philanthropic impact, operational effectiveness impact? Are you changing up your business model and, and model and transforming it? Um, two, recruit allies to accelerate your impact. Can you be strategic about that? Three, can you align your CSR metrics with your core business metrics? It will get more people involved in the CSR program and will be better aligned for your overall purpose. Four, can you change your access to distinguish your program and find that ownable territory. And five, document your program's defining moments and understanding those and being able to, able to message those in a deep way. So Jackson, I know you jumped in, you jumped out. Are there any uh, kind of final questions before we wrap up with the, the, the final thought of the day? And, you know, I think we're good. Um, but as long as we've got everyone here, oh, one question from Yvonne is, is there a sample plan you can share with us? Yvonne, I'm sharing some contact information uh, right now. I'm sharing a, a link you can go to for today's slides. I'm sharing a link to uh, Ben's YouTube channel. So please uh, go, go subscribe there and check out this and other presentations. I'm also sharing Ben's LinkedIn, Twitter, and email address. Um, so you can absolutely get in touch after, um, after the webinar and, and we can help you find what you're looking for, Yvonne. Yeah, no, and I, I think, you know, what I would say, um, th there is some things that we can share. I mean, I think, you know, there's really like kind of three parts to, to, to how you would kind of like develop a program. So one is CSR strategy. So you'd actually do kind of like a whole discovery part about we're going to interview stakeholders and customers and um, other key players. And so you do that to kind of like develop the strategy and the goal is to get to um, ultimately what we would call sort of like your CSR manifesto, which is like the one page rallying cry of, of what you're all about. So that's kind of phase one. Um, then uh, phase two is actually all about sort of CSR execution. So once you have that strategy outlined, there's a number of tasks from um, metrics to reporting to feedback so how do you actually execute that? That's kind of the second part of the plan. And then third is CSR expression. And that's how do you communicate this beyond uh, yourself to third parties? Is there a PR program? Is there um, other allies that we're, we're, we're coordinating with? And so those will kind of be the three parts. And if you shoot me an email, maybe I can kind of show you what some of those, those, those parts of the, the sort of the process um, look like in terms of templates. So let me end um, maybe there on, on kind of the final thought of the day. And that final thought uh, is, before my kind of final point about CSR programs, is, is what is the one thing? Um, tweet at me, at Benjamin Kaplan. Let me know what is the one thing that you remember, take away, sticks with you. We'd love to know what aspects of this are, are, are more sticky. Um, two, this is my email address. Jackson posted. Um, I have many email addresses at each of our agencies, but that's probably the, the, the best one to get to me from, from webinars, ben.kaplan at prhacker.com. And then if you want today's slides, uh, you can go here to the new rules of CSR. And, uh, and we will get you those slides as well. And finally, um, if you want, this is a little little trick hack for this, is actually hold up your uh, your smartphone right here. Um, oh, and my little flashlight's on. Hold it up right here. Um, get uh, your LinkedIn app open. Click on that little QR code uh, in the search box. And if you do it, you can scan someone else's code. And that will take you right to my LinkedIn page if you just hold up to your computer and scan the code. Um, or you can just type it in linkedin.com um, slash in slash Kaplan Ben. And uh, take a screenshot of this if it's easier. And just, I don't accept every LinkedIn request. So all you got to do for me to accept is just write, hey, I attended your um, CSR webinar. And then um, let's connect and let's uh, share thoughts that way as well. So final thought of the day, just to kind of uh, wrap up, um, is that um, I think with, you know, with corporate social responsibility, with CSR programs, the key is to make things incrementally better. We talked about how the old way was like, let's make a big splash with a whole new program. Yes, we want to make a big splash, but I think the faster way to progress is to make small, uh, uh, specific, and, and ongoing action steps. So if you can't do it all today, that's okay, but like, what can you roll out 
this quarter? If, if you can't roll out the 10 things you want to do, how can you focus on the two that moves you further along? What can you then do for next quarter? How can you use each aspect that you roll out to get more alignment, more support, to get more involved? So uh, if, if you're a company that has an existing program like Bernadette, I think there's small incremental things you can do to constantly move the ball forward, and the result is like compound interest. You get better and better and better. If you're a new company that has never done this before, um, I think keep uh, your focus uh, kind of uh, you know, in front of you. Find small ways to, 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 to launch elements of the program, and then you will discover how that can build over time. And finally, align your business objectives with your CSR objectives. Doing good is um, good for business, and it should be. Um, and find ways to connect those together, and you'll have a much more sustainable program, a much more um, impactful program, and I think you'll be much better off in the long run. So thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks, Jackson, for hosting. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions and um, would love to hear more about what you're doing in your CSR program and how we might be able to help. All right, cheers.